Welcome, and thank you for joining today's NISPAC meeting. To receive all pertinent information about upcoming NISPAC meetings, please subscribe to ISOO Overview at isoo-overview.blogs.archives.gov or by going to the Federal Register. All available meeting materials, including today's agenda, slides, and biographies for NISPAC members and speakers, have been posted to the ISOO website at archives.gov slash ISOO slash oversight hyphen groups slash NISPAC slash committee dot HTML and have also been emailed to all registrants. Please note not all NISPAC members and speakers have biographies or slides. While connecting by phone is necessary to attend today's meeting, there is no requirement to log on to WebEx. However, you are welcome to join WebEx with the link provided with your registration as all available materials will be shared during the meeting on that platform. If you have connected through WebEx, please ensure you have opened the participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a private chat message to the event producer. All links will also be shared periodically through WebEx chat. Please note all audio connections will be muted for the duration of the meeting with the exception of NISPAC members, speakers, and ISO, ISOO. Excuse me. We are expecting a fairly large audience today. Because of this, we will not be taking questions from the public. Please email your questions and comments to nispac at nara.gov and someone will get with you offline. Only ISOO and NISPAC members will be authorized to ask questions throughout the meeting. At the conclusion, a survey will be sent for your feedback. If you would like to be contacted regarding your survey responses, please include your email in the comments block so the NISPAC team can get back to you personally. With that, let me turn things over to Mr. Mark Bradley, the Director of the Information Security Oversight Office, as well as the Chairman of the NISPAC. Thank you very much, Madam Producer. I appreciate that. Thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, morning, everybody. Welcome to the 66th meeting of the National Industrial Security Program Policy Advisory Committee, commonly known as the NISPAC. This is the third NISPAC meeting that's been conducted 100% virtually, although we now understand some people are home, like we are, and some people are at work, um, actually in the office. This is a public meeting, like our um, previous NISPAC meetings, this one will be recorded. The recording along with the transcript and minutes, should be available within 90 days on the NISPAC reports on committee activities webpage mentioned earlier by our event producer. We are planning on a five-minute break in the middle of the meeting, so I'll flag it as we move closer to that. I will now begin attendance with the government members. I will state the name of the agency, and the agency member will reply by identifying uh, himself or herself. Once I've gone through the government members, I will then proceed with the industry members. Uh, after the industry members, we will immediately move into our uh, speakers. Let me start with uh, the ODNI. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Morning. And Valerie Kerman. Oh, hi, hi, Valerie. Department of Defense. Uh, good morning, Mark. This is Jeff Spinninger. Good morning, Jeff. Department of Energy. Good morning, Mark Hanoski. Is on. Good morning, Mark. NRC. Yes, good morning, everybody. This is Dennis Brady with the NRC. Good morning, Dennis. DHS. Good morning, Mark. This is uh, Rob McCray and Rich DeJosserman. Good morning, gentlemen. DCSA. Good morning, Keith Miners, DCSA. Good morning, Keith. CIA. And it still appears we're missing a rep from the agency. Department of Commerce. They sent an email. They're not going to be able to make it. Okay. Well, all right. Department of Commerce again. Okay. Okay. Department of, oh, I'm sorry. Somebody going to speak? All right. Department of Justice. Hi, uh, Kathleen. Good morning, Mark. Kathleen Berry, stand in for Christine Gunning. Hi. Good morning. 
NASA. Good morning, Kenneth Jones with NASA. Good morning, Kenneth. National Security Agency. Good morning, this is Brad Weatherby from the National Security Agency. Good morning, Brad. Department of State. Good morning, this is Kim Bogger from State Department. Good morning, Kim. Department of Air Force. Good morning, Jennifer Aquinas here from Department of Air Force. Good morning, Department of the Navy. Good morning, this is Jennifer Bernier with Department of Navy. Good morning to you, Department of the Army. Good morning, everybody. This is Jim Anderson from Department of the Army. Good morning, Jim. All right, now I'm going to turn to our industry members. Heather Sims, are you present? Heather Sims is present. Okay. Dan McGarvey, are you present? Dan McGarvey is present. Good morning, Mark. All right. Morning, morning, Dan. Dennis Ariaga. Uh, Dennis Ariaga is present. Good morning. Morning, Dennis. Morning to you. Rosie Boyo. Good morning, Rosie Barrero is present. Okay, morning, Rosie. Cheryl Stone. Cheryl Stone is present. Okay, April Abbott. Good morning, present. Morning, April. Gary Jones. Gary Jones is present. Great. Tracy Durkin. Good morning, Tracy Durkin is present. Good morning, Tracy. Right now I'm gonna do just a very quick roll call for our speakers, make sure everybody's here. All right, Stacy Boschanek. I'm here. Great. Terry Russell Hunter. I am here. Great. Roy Jacino. Yes, I am here. Great. Chris Pollock. Good morning, I'm here too. Great. Mariana Martineau. Good morning, I'm here as well. Okay. Heather Green. Good morning. Good morning to you. Heather Mordaga. Good morning. Good morning. Sheldon Solstice. Good morning. Good morning. Charles Tinch. Matt Roach. Good morning. Good morning, Matt. Jason Terrio. Good morning. Morning to you. Booker Bland. Good morning. Morning, Booker. David Scott. Yes, good morning. Morning to you. Selena Hutchison. Good morning, everyone. All right, morning to you. Evan Korn. Morning. I am. All right. Rich Dijasarand. I'm with DHS, but yes, I'm here. Great. Morning. All right. Is anyone else speaking from the NAS the, the, uh, the MISPAC that I have not heard from or that I do not know about? If so, please speak now. All right. We request that everyone uh, identify themselves by name and agency before speaking each time for the record, because again, what this is, as you all know all too well, this is recorded and we have a transcript. So it's much, much easier on us transcribing if we can actually match a name with the, uh, with the spoken words. So with that, uh, we me give you just a couple of updates. We have a, uh, we've had a few changes to the NISPAC membership. We'd like to welcome alternate Natasha Sumter with the Department of Energy. Tracy Kendall also remains an alternate. Additionally, we'd like to welcome Elizabeth O'Kane representing the Army and Robin Nickel, alternate with the Navy. For two of our industry members, this is their last NISPAC meeting as members, Dan McGarvey and Dennis Baragio. So anyway, gentlemen, thank you for your uh, your service. I mean, you've really made uh, some really nice contributions and we are most grateful for your, uh, your service. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Greg Pannoni, who is my deputy, who will address the status of action items from the November 18th, 2020 meeting, Greg. Uh, thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we just had a couple of items, but before that, I want to mention that the NISPAC minutes from the last meeting were finalized on January 26th and were posted to the ISU website on February 2nd. Um, as far as the two action items, they, they're both with uh, DCSA. Um, the first one 
that's uh, outstanding from the last meeting was the industrial security letter. We refer to them as ISLs, or in, and this one was on insider threat, and it will replace ISL 2016-02. It's in a bit of a holding pattern due to the release of the NISPOM rule, um, but DCSA will continue processing the ISL for issuance and begin engagement with cleared industry through the NISPAC to update tools, resources, and required training with respect to the insider threat ISL. Um, the, the second action item still open uh, has to do with DCSA uh, providing an update on their responsibility for accreditations of sensitive department and information facilities, otherwise known as SCIFs. Um, and DCSA will be responsible for the accreditation of military department SCIFs, fourth estate SCIFs, and contractor SCIFs that fall under DCSA. So do any of the NISPAC members uh, have any questions about the action item status? Okay, thank you. Um, back to you, Mr. Chair. Sure, my, thank, thank you, Greg. Now, at this time, uh, we'll go to our speakers. My first one is uh, Ms. Heather Sims, the NISPAC spokesperson who will provide the industry update. Heather, all yours. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to provide industry's uh, collective perspective today on a variety of um, NISP topics and priorities for 2021. Even though it's only April, it's not too early for industry members um, that are interested in serving um, as a NISPAC industry member to start thinking about whether you want to um, throw your name in the hat. We have September elections uh, coming up very fast. If any industry partners are interested, contact um, a current NISPAC industry member or an MOU member. Industry continues to increase um, their engagement and collaboration with a variety of government agencies in order to be more actively involved in our national security role. These may have really bad allergies. <clears throat> industry cannot be a sometimes stakeholder partner. NISPAC industry members, along with MOU industry association members, continue to work tirelessly fostering relationships and trust in order to bridge the gaps between government and industry. Adapting the change has become industry's middle name. We lose Heather. Heather, are we you there? Have. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I don't see her line at the moment. I think it may have. It just fell, I guess. Yeah, I think it may have dropped off. Maybe go to Jeff and come back. All right. Jeff, I'm going to bring you out of the bullpen. <laughs> All right, Coach. All right. So, anyway, we're going to, as we try to resurface Heather, I'm going to turn to Jeffrey Spinninger, Director for Critical Technology Protection for the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, who will give the update on behalf of DOD as the NISP Executive Agent. Jeffrey, all yours. Uh, uh, well, Mark, thank you very much for that. And, uh, in, and uh, should Heather uh, come back on, I'm, I'm more than happy to go back into mute mode and, uh, and let her continue. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, thanks for that. Um, and and thanks, thanks for the opportunity as ever today. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable how we've, um, you know, been able to adapt uh, and, and uh, execute uh, in, in this remote environment. I'm pretty sure I said the last time, and I'll continue to say, uh, however, I, I look forward to the opportunity for us to, uh, you know, to get back in, uh, in a room together, uh, you, know, uh, you know, both for the sum and substance of the official portion of the meeting, but frankly for the candid conversations, uh, you know, that happen uh, in and amongst the, the women and men who, uh, who participate in, uh, in these meetings. I think they're very, very important uh, and, and something I'm looking very forward to, uh, uh, to um, to being on the receiving end uh, in the future. 
Uh, so with that, uh, our update uh, today, uh, I have a number of things to, to go over. Uh, some I'll hit the wave tops on, uh, more, uh, de deferring uh, much more so to uh, some detail that will come later in the brief uh, in the meeting today, uh, principally from Keith Miner and others, uh, others at DCSA. Uh, you know, but uh, the, uh, the alligator that's, uh, that's been nearest our boat or in our boat here for, uh, for a good long while is, uh, is, is now, uh, you know, or shortly to become, uh, you know, I don't know, mounted or, you know, at a zoo someplace or something. Uh, but the NISPOM federal rule became effective on February 24th. Uh, and uh, as many of you know, that is a years-long, uh, you know, undertaking. Uh, you know, that, uh, that our office, uh, you know, uh, principally Valerie Heil uh, uh, and, and many, many others um, have, uh, you know, have, have been, you know, patiently and persistently, um, I think the technical term is slogging through uh, for what amounts to several years. Uh, big, it's a big deal. I, I know I said in the, in the prior meeting uh, when we were forecasting this, uh, I'll continue to say it, uh, you know, the, much of the sum of the and substance of the NISPOM remains unchanged. There are a number of elements uh, that, uh, that, 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 that many of you are becoming aware of now that have. Um, but uh, the biggest single takeaway, our, our single sentence uh, that, uh, that we continue to, uh, to champion here within the building is that it creates more accountability on government. Uh, and we think that that's, uh, that's really critical. It's the key to consistency uh, where, the uh, where, the, where the program itself is intended to be, and that is in industry, right? So uh, it's not a hard sentence to, to get through. It's, it's going to be very, very hard and challenging in execution, but we're very excited at the, at the prospects of actually getting to that execution layer uh, here, uh, you know, later in the, uh, in the year. Um, we are uh, adjudicating a number of comments uh, that, uh, that did come through in the public period. Uh, I think in total uh, we received 84 comments, um, and uh, just because we're metrics driven around here, I uh, just wanted to give some context to that to our leadership. About 60% of those came in as a collective uh, submission from our NISPAC industry partners, and honestly I cannot thank you enough for that, right? So the, the due diligence that, uh, that we undertake to be, uh, to be able to go through each comment uh, is, um, is, is a very deliberate process, and our accountability is, frankly, to people who uh, don't know a whole lot about the NISPOM, right? Their expertise is in policy, right, federal regulatory policy, and being able to, be, uh, to make it through the, what amounts to an audit uh, by them, uh, you know, requires, uh, you know, it's not an easy undertaking. And so the work that was done by, by Heather and the, and the other industry folks, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to consolidate inputs, uh, you know, before they ever got to us through the formal, uh, the formal process uh, will absolutely save us a tremendous amount of time. And uh, it really speaks to the, uh, the, the collaborative nature of the NISPAC, I think, and its intent, but more than that, in its execution. Uh, and I, I really do thank you a lot for that. Uh, we're an army of about three. Uh, and, and one of those is me, and I just sort of nod up and down like a bobblehead uh, when we get into much of the details. And so it's kind of, uh, it's, it's very, very, um, in, in, you know, important to have that partnership and to really call it out. Um, Breaking down those 84 comments a little bit, the key issues uh, that we're presently adjudicating are reasonably summarized as focused on seed three. Certainly going to hear more about that. I, I anticipate that uh, when, when Heather rejoins us that she'll have some comments, and, and I know that Keith will as well. Um, you know, uh, further guidance with respect to trusted workforce and continuous vetting. Um, 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 uh, NIDS and Section 842 are, are making, uh, making a, you know, made a, a small resurgence in the, in the, in the discussion uh, and clarification with respect to safeguarding. Uh, so we're preparing a proposed amendment to the rule uh, to address each of these comments and resulting changes. Uh, this will go through a DOD internal coordination and then on to OMB review for about 90 days. Um, and there's some fudge factor in those timelines. Uh, you know, the OMB collects these sorts of issues and processes from across the federal government. Uh, and so while it's hard for us to imagine anything more important in the industrial security program, I think it's fair to say that there's more than one thing going on. Um, uh, and that's where interagency review comes in. Uh, so I, all that in mind, we can't really give a specific timeline uh, to how that will unfold. Uh, um, you know, we. Um, Probably put ourselves uh, on, a, on a spring glide path. I think we have some pretty firm, uh, you know, timelines to be able to provide uh, where we to meet in Ju July. Um, but but uh, m in, in as much as we're not going to do that, we'll uh, we'll try to provide a we'll, we will provide update through uh, through the working groups uh, as they continue to happen. Uh, so I, I mentioned uh, 
the uh, C3 ISL that came out, uh, you know, went out for NISPAC uh, comments. We've gotten those back. Uh, they are extensive. Uh, we thank you for those many comments that, uh, that came in from industry and government alike. Um, we, there's a lot in there. There's a lot to unpack. Um, uh, a lot, lot of focus on the implementation timelines, uh, you, you know, that, uh, that are getting a lot of attention right now. Uh, we'll keep you updated on those. Uh, I think, uh, like I said, Keith may have a, a few more comments on it, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, we're trying to, to, you know, continue a, a steady drumbeat that we can all maintain. Uh, the ISL is not new. Um, you know, so as we start to make progress, uh, you know, and, and come to common understanding uh, with respect to implementation, uh, that is a team sport and one that, uh, that will, you know, will continue, uh, you know, to follow um, that uh, going forward. Um, a word on the ISL, right? So, uh, and again, you'll hear more about ISL processes generally, but uh, one of the changes in the, in the um, you know, by virtue of the issuance uh, as a federal rule is that OMB, uh, you know, so our, our issuance of industrial security letters uh, although ultimately approved by uh, and will be issued, uh, you know, as, as has been our practice by the undersecretary, uh, we need an OMB coordination before uh, that happens, and so that's uh, that's another step in the process. And um, and so the first one uh, will be a bit of an experiment, uh, and that should inform what our uh, you know recurring processes will look like for subsequent um, security letters. Uh, there's been quite a bit of discussion, uh, you know, with respect to federal information systems and the spec the specific term. Um, a lot of questions on, on uh, uh, you know, uh, regarding the policy on information and federal information systems, uh, you know, uh, as it's described and defined within Volume 2 of the DOD Manual. Uh, we believe the term federal information system itself is, uh, is, a, is a source of some confusion. Um, you know, in the past, uh, in federal information systems were previously referred to as guest systems, which meant a system approved by another government organization. Uh, DCSA has authorized federal systems in the hands of cleared industry for many years. However, some government customers uh, are reading uh, the Volume 2 uh, Federal Information Systems paragraph as the only way to adhere to policy for their systems, which uh, we, we think is not really the case. So we're kind of sifting through that. You know, uh, you know folks are trying to be you know, as deliberate as possible, um, but with the, with the you know, the heavy and in, in, in increasing reliance on, uh, you know, on, on the extensions of systems of this type, um, you know, we are, uh, we're looking to work through uh, and, and come to common understanding, uh, you know, policy clarification where necessary. Um, at this time, however, if industry or government customers told to disconnect a previously proved system, uh, please raise the issue to the regional authorizing officials uh, in, uh, who will engage this, uh, this, this directly, right? So, um, uh, you know, happy to take questions on that uh, and address concerns here, you know, either here today or, of course, through the working group um, as, it, as it goes forward. Um, discussions regarding solid state device sanitization destruction policy, uh, largely deferring at this point to NSA for further, any further guidance uh, for the, in, the, uh, in future NISA working group meetings on the topic. Uh, for industry, uh, you know, um, they don't need us to speak for them, but I think it bears mentioning that DCSA vol follows uh, Volume 2 guidance, which does allow some flexibility for the government information owner to accept a risk of sanitization risk rather than destruction. We recommend, however, if industry has specific sanitization uh, products or questions that you, uh, you would like to, to, to address or utilize, you either submit them directly to NSA for evaluation uh, or speak to your government customer. Uh, for further guidance. A um, couple more, uh, you know, topics that are really, um, you know, kind of growing near and dear to us here. Um, I mentioned last time Section 847 in the FY20 uh, NDAA includes a requirement uh, for assessment of beneficial ownership uh, pertaining to foreign ownership control and influence for DOD prime and subcontracts uh, that are uh, more than $5 million in value. Uh, it will require a DFARS clause uh, that will go through the rulemaking process. Uh, um, however, in advance of that process, uh, DOD right now is in, uh, in, in, uh, is in the nascent stages of a draft DOD instruction. Uh, it is presently in, uh, in the internal coordination phases within, uh, within the, uh, com the DOD compartment, uh, com components excuse me, uh, under USDINS. Uh, from there, it will make its way uh, out through and into the formal issuance process. Um, there's a lot of congressional attention uh, on this particular issue, um, uh, you know, FOCI and, and Supply Chain Risk Management, which uh, Stacey Bustanik is going to go into is, um, quite a bit more detail on, uh, I think, in her briefing here later. Uh, these are, you know, 
um, uh, near synonymous terms, right, uh, and, and, uh, tremendous, and the source of tremendous amounts of interest. And so this particular one, uh, the expansion of foci um, to pretty comprehensively uh, is uh, something that is, um, uh, is garnering the, uh, the, the, uh, the interest, as you would imagine. Um, uh, you know, for our purposes, like I said, this begins through the issuance process to define kind of what the, what the, you know, how we would get after the provisions that are within the NDAA uh, and left, right rudder guidance, uh, as it were, for DCSA as the executing agency. Uh, and, and honestly, and that's where the real work begins. And so as it continues to unfold, we'll, uh, we'll certainly be looking for, uh, you know, government and industry inputs on, uh, on this very, very important topic. The uh, last two things uh, I'd like to get into, one is a little bit, I don't try to do a whole lot of forecasting, but one thing I'd like to put out there, right, so my, uh, our office within USDINS uh, is the sponsor of the University Affiliate Research Center uh, called the Applied Research Laboratory for Intelligence and Security. Uh, so at, at some point, as some of you may have some familiarity with this, I don't want to spend a lot of time, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just about out of, uh, out of time myself. But I, I wanted to put out there right, uh, kind of a nod back to the discussion on information systems earlier. Uh, but we're sponsoring a, pro a project up at Arliss right now that, uh, that I want to put out here for uh, just public awareness and that uh, it'll tee us up for more substantive um, uh, you know, reporting on this project uh, uh, when we're next together in the fall. Um, but in, in, in short, uh, we're exploring uh, the use of commercial classified cloud uh, in the NISP. Uh, Arliss is going to conduct a pilot working with a small number of NIST companies to independently evaluate uh, the connections and approvals process. Uh, the project builds on observable improvements to interoperability, cybersecurity, and core requirements for information security in th insider threat, uh, user activity monitoring for highly classified IT and DoD requirements pertaining to compartmented programs uh, that are already in work today, and similar application uh, and, and exploring how those uh, can meet uh, similar application and requirements, uh, you know, that, uh, that are presently uh, uh, executed under the, uh, uh, under the NISP. And so, um, so uh, we think there's a lot there, you know, um, you know there's ba basically cloud, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the most highly uh, compartmented aspects of, of work done in industry, and there's certainly cloud within the unclassified space. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunity to explore the, the same op, uh, options, uh, you know, kind of in the, in, the, in, the, in the expanse of the industrial security program is something that we think we're, um, there's, uh, there's, a, there's quite a bit of potential there. And we look forward to, uh, to leveraging, um, you know, uh, what we have up there and a pretty powerful tool in, uh, in, in our list to, uh, to showcase, uh, you know, kind of the, I'll call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last thing I think you'll hear a lot more about, right, you know, uh, you know operating within a COVID environment, you know, Mark Brent mentioned, you know, uh, you know that some, some folks, so there's, there is a slow returning to work. I'm, I, I, God help me, but I'm happy to be saying that I'm sitting in the Pentagon uh, on the call today. Um, and, and remind me, I said that uh, maybe in November, but it is nice to be back to work with some, uh, you know, regularity, right? Uh, the work didn't go away, and that's true for everyone out here. Um, but one of the things that we continue to look at and continue to capitalize is, right, this environment has forced us to find ways to get work done and in some ways really confront, uh, confront some of the kind of longstanding processes that we've undertaken and evaluate whether or not those are the right ways to do business. Are they the, they're, 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 they're certainly the way that they're defined, but are they the right and, and best way to manage uh, risk as it pertains to sec uh, gen general security, not just, you know, uh, but with an eye for industrial security. And I, I think uh, we're, we're looking to capitalize on what, what lessons we are learning to, uh, to make revisions in policy uh, and, uh, and get better at, uh, at, at really, you know, defining what our requirements are uh, and then executing against those requirements in the future. So uh, that's kind of my, my minor soapbox moment, but I am uh, uh, right at my 15-minute mark. So I'm going to stop right there and, uh, and turn it back to you, Mark. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone have any questions for uh, Jeff before we let him off the hook here? Okay. Hearing none. Uh, is Heather Sims back? Yeah, she's back, Mark. Yep. All right. So we, Heather, uh, would you like to pick up where you left off? I'm back in. I think I was talking about adapting to change, and I have to continue to do that as technically challenged. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, <laughs> I am back in, and thanks for that update, Jeff. Um, that was great. I, I don't. I was wondering how um, DOD would take industry having so many comments on the ISL. So I was pleasantly surprised when you mentioned that uh, you appreciated the feedback. So thank you for that. 
So I'm briefly going to talk about um, our, our current top three industry um, priorities and some of our watch list items. Um, they're listed on the slide, but I'm not going to talk in any particular order. Um, the long-awaited new 32 CFR Part 117, um, the new NISPOM, is currently a, a major focus of industry uh, while we move to implement and also adjust to the new changes. I would like to say um, thank you to DOD and DCSA for your early and meaningful um, industry engagement. The more industry engagements are, are the better um, in our mind. We look forward to uh, hearing from the other CSAs today how they plan to implement oversight of the new NISPOM declared industry. Um, and I would also encourage my industry partners to actually read the new NISPOM yourself and don't make assumptions of what's there and what's not there. Uh, we also look for um, more engagement with PAC PMO, ODNI, and OPM um, as trusted workforce continues to mature. Information sharing continues to be a challenging um, item for industry. While some of my industry members uh, focus specifically on improvements within the intelligence community, it's a much wider impact on all of industry. Industry often has to manage the security programs blindly. Industry is challenged with sharing um, of adverse information of our cleared employees, potential insider threats identified by the government, target threats against our companies um, and our products and services we provide to the government, that industry is charged with protecting against threats. Um, so we would like to um, have engagements with our uh, government partners to talk about how we can increase information sharing. Industry is also challenged with being able to share known threats between companies without fear of reprisal and lawsuits. Information sharing with industry holistically is a challenge and improvements would only strengthen our ability to provide better security mitigation strategies within cleared industry. I'll touch a little bit on supply chain. Um, it's been a hot topic for many years, but we're seeing a lot of action um, in the implementation of many statutory and regulatory requirements embedded into the acquisition process. It's not necessarily NIST focused, but there's a direct impact to the NIST at large and the supply chain of the, uh, of the NIST. As government begins to get back to normal, industry understands there will be fundamental changes to how we operate. Many industry partners will continue to operate virtually for the foreseeable future, while others begin the process of bringing remote workers back to the office and some variations in between. Industry does look forward to hearing from the five CSAs today on the return, work, return to work cut plans and how industry can be prepared as we anticipate a return to in-person oversight visits. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the recent JPAS to this transition. While this wasn't easy by any means, I will say we had a lot of pain points and a lot still mm -hmm. exists. There's still quite a few lessons learned. Thanks to Sheldon Saltis for truly listening and working on fixes for industry's concerns with the continued issues with functionality of the system and data integrity with a sense of urgency. We've heard a lot of excuses of why the process went so poorly, but the bottom line is we can't allow this to happen again. One, if not the largest government system utilized to verify and validate eligibility and access levels, is still not where it should be operationally, and we're already talking about its replacement. While industry has started NDIS engagements with government partners, industry will not let up on requests for a strategic rollout plan, increased communications, training, and an understanding of how industry will utilize the system. Industry understands we're not alone with exerting an enormous amount of resources in validating and correcting disinformation, but we have to do better. Industry is preparing for the implementation of the new NISPOM, managing and validating and correcting data in DIS, anticipating such a workforce 2.0, preparing for CMMC assessments, and trying to manage the role of controlled unclassified information, CUI. <laughs> While we are often reminded that CUI is not than this, there is no doubt um, an impact to clear the industry and will continue to be impacted by UI implementation and oversight. We're already experiencing a bifurcation of the program. Each federal agency has been charged with developing a program, but when it, what industry is dealing with is an interpretation and implementation strategy that vary by government um, agencies. Each program, each base is coming up with their own set of rules, leaving industry in the middle of managing expectations. Industry only has so much time and resources to manage their program. We need better oversight of government agencies to ensure a consistent approach is levied on industry. With continued engagement, a shared respect between government and industry partners, we can strengthen our NISP, protecting our government, 
our, excuse me, our economic prosperity and continue our war fighting competitive edge over our adversaries. With industry, we can help ourselves by continuing to be united in our industry priorities with the government partners at a strategic level. Understand we can better together, we can be better together than simply our own and individual company interests. Most importantly, stay informed, stay connected, and stay engaged. As I conclude, I'd like to thank um, the industry partners and the government partners for increasing our engagement this past year. Um, thanks for your time today, and I look forward to a strengthened relationship. And most importantly, I look forward to in-person meetings again so I, I don't continue with job calls. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for uh, Heather? Okay. Thank you, Heather. I'm glad we got you back. All right, we'll now hear from Mr. Keith Minard, Senior Policy Advisor with the Critical Technology Protection of the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. Keith, yours. So, thanks. Good morning. Keith Minard, DCSA. Today I'll be providing an update on DCSA planning efforts for industry and our internal implementation of 32 CFR Part 117, the NISPOM rule. Then I'll provide a short update on our COVID and post-COVID NISP oversight operations planning. As uh, Mr. Spinnaker already mentioned from DOD, 32 CFR Part 117, the NISPOM rule is now effective. Since he already addressed some key changes, I will focus on the activities to support implementation of the NISPOM rule by cleared industry. Um, what I would like to note first, though, is that I believe the other CSAs may be providing some information, so I'd like to note that the planning by DCSA is for cleared contractors under DOD cognizance only. If you fall under another NIST CSA, please contact them for additional guidance. So as Jeff mentioned, thanks to the NISPAC members for the review of the NISP rule, implementation of industrial security letters, and the C3ISL. As noted, the C3ISL has a wide range of comments. Comments from industry do help us understand industry's implementation guidance requirements and questions they have as we put, provide, put these together and uh, draft them, coordinate them, and, and issue these ISLs. Really, the ISL is there to help clarify, interpret, and provide guidance for industry to better implement portions of the NISPOM requirements. So in addition to the development and coordination of the C3 ISLs and the implementation ISL, DCSA policy in late January developed and fielded a NISPOM rule cross-reference tool that enables readers to select known sections of the current NISPOM, and it takes the user to the portion of the rule that it aligns. You can find the tool on the CDSE website. The cross-reference tool is really a great place to start when reviewing the rule and ease as much of the transition due to the formatting changes of the NISPOM from a, from a DOD manual to a federal regulation. As Heather already mentioned, I think one of the important things that we have to do is, is people need to read the rule. Um, I think it helps bring clarity and understanding of what changes there are and what things actually convey from the existing DOD manual to the federal regulation. I'd just like to note that over a few weeks ago, the tools have been downloaded over 2,500 times. I wasn't able to get an accurate update for today's meeting, but I'm sure we're probably closer to 3,000. So, it's important to engage industry as we move through this process. And I kind of like to think this is very similar to 2016 when chain, this pump change two came out about insider threat. Our first event was held on March 25th and was hosted by CDSE. This was like the kickoff webinar focused on the NISPOM rule. The webinar had over 800 attendees and provided an overview of the rule for attendees and included panel members not only from DCSA, but also from the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security and Industrial Security Policy. Thanks to them for this joint participation. We are currently working with the NISPAC industry lead and NCMS to plan in late April two additional webinars. The first webinar from CDSE, I will call it a fire hose. Now we need to turn the flow down and begin to discuss more in details, get to be more like a sprinkler. So the next webinar will be focused on key changes in this POM rule and other key elements that we are either hearing from industry that needs clarification or where DCSA sees an opportunity to help provide guidance and clarification. A follow-on webinar will be focused on safeguarding, one of the other key changes. This session is in part to better educate on the changes in this POM rule referral to, NAT, referral to national information security policy in 32 CFR Part 2001 and to provide an update on the changes for certification of intrusion detection systems, uh, reference UL 2050 and reference the use of other nationally recognized tech laboratories. Uh, more to follow on scheduling. And additionally, the next steps will be planning for webinars to engage industry on C3 reporting requirements. As you can kind of see, we're kind of thinking that we started off with the broad 
the scope of talking about the NISPOM rule. We'll break it down to key changes. And as we move through this implementation period, we'll identify those key areas that we can use and, and help industry leveraging understanding through webinars, uh, webinars and other communication capabilities. So to ensure effective communication, DCSA has added an external, external facing web page that is now live. It's intended to be a single source of NISPOM rule information, key changes, events, link to tools and policy, and we are looking at adding frequently asked questions for postings related to NISPOM rule to better enable its implementation. This is similar to the web page that supported NISPOM change two and insider threat in 2016. Uh, we'll share with ISU the link to that page so they can post on their blog, but the page can be found on the DCSA website. Go to missionary, then CTP, and you'll find a link at the bottom of the page for the NISPOM rule. You also find that the link, uh, there's a link to the cross-reference tool on the NISPOM rule page also, as it is also on CDSE's tools under FSO toolbox. I would like to note that um, we're working with our public affairs to make sure that we're also using social media to communicate updates on the NISPOM rule. And one of the things we worked with, so at the bottom of the NISPOM rule page, please take the opportunity to view the video at the bottom of that page called Get Ready for the Rule. It kind of gets some key points and outlines some of the key changes in the NISPOM rule. During the implementation period, we'll be working to address input challenges identified by Clarity Industry and to work to address what tools and job aids, webinars or communications or guidance in the form of additional ISLs would address those challenges. So in addition to the implementation of C3 ISL, we've completed a scrub of our existing ISLs, identified some that have to be reissued, and I would say expect to see those uh, reissued ISLs for coordination sometime in the near term through the NISPAC for industry comment and coordination. Again, not all existing ISLs will remain, but we do, did, it, did identify those that need to be reissued. So, and this will be a reissuance of existing guidance, so I wouldn't be too much concerned about major changes. They're being re revised to align with the NISPOM rule formatting, citations, and other areas like that. One of the key focus areas that uh, Jeff already mentioned, we know we'll need to be working with industry on, as I mentioned already uh, an extra webinar, is Security Executive Agent Directive 3 reporting requirements. That, that's very important to ensure there's communication guidance and any tools that are needed to support that implementation. I would note that while it's now included in the NISPOM rule, everyone must keep in mind that these, this is a national policy requirement on the reporting um, for those that personnel with access to classified information or hold a sensitive uh, position. As with industry, DCSA, CTP, and CDSC are reviewing our products and tools to align with the NISPOM rule. This includes oversight procedures for changes, aligning citations to the NISPOM rule, and updating our systems, as well as CDSC revising tools, training, and resources. So what should industry, what should industry do? First, download the cross-reference tool and the NISPOM rule. Begin by clicking on sections in the current NISPOM you are very familiar with, then read the corresponding rule language. Get familiar. This will help you understand that while now a federal regulation, there are some key changes for industry to, to implement, but much of the NISPOM remained the same or had very minor changes or revisions. Finally, DCSA is working to ensure our field personnel are consistent in message on the rule. DCSA field personnel will not begin overseeing the new NISPOM rule until its implementation date. So closing on this topic, I would be remiss if I didn't mention a couple of my staff members who have been very um, been leading efforts in our office to support this implementation by DCSA and had an impact on many of the topics that I've already discussed, the, the webinars, the web page, the tool, and the ISLs. This includes Booker Bland, Larry Piles, and Jason Terrio. So that, that's kind of my closure on the NISPOM rule information. I'll go ahead and hit some COVID talking points here, and then I'll open up for any questions. With the onset of COVID-19 travel restrictions last March, CTP shifted from regular operations to remote only activities. Our first priority was the health and safety of workforce and yours. Secondarily, we focus on maintaining our support to your facilities and continue to conduct oversight responsibilities. COVID limited our, our ability to physically conduct on-site actions. For example, ATOs were issued without the necessary on-site review, virtual closed area approvals, and administration inquiries were conducted virtually. The CMs involved telephonic discussions with cleared contractors and their facility security officers to assert, ascertain the overall status of the security program. And the CM is really a touch point, not an assessment. Therefore, no security ratings resulted from the CMs. To date, uh, DCSA has conducted over 7,000 CMs in the past year. 
So the first priority when we can safely begin scheduling on-site contractor visits will be actions that have been delayed over the past year. This would include final assessments and approvals of storage that have been done without on-site validation, review of information systems that need verifications, and review of corrective actions from our CMs. So that kind of gives you an update of where we're in the CMs. And I would note that additionally today, later on, at the, clear, at the updates of the working groups, you'll hear from Mr. David Scott, who is now serving as the DCSA CTP accrediting authority, and Ms. Mariana Martin, who's the assistant director for the CAF, who will provide an update on DCSA vetting stats during the working group updates. Subject to your questions, this is all I have for today. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for uh, Keith? Thank you, Keith. All right, next we're going to hear from Ms. Valerie Kerbin, Senior Security Advisor, Special Security Director, National Counterintelligence and Security Center Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Valerie, yours. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I also echo what Jeff and Heather said. It would be great when we can all get together again and, um, you know, work together in person um, by this virtual environment. Um, so I'm going to, to provide you all an update since um, we spoke at the last November NISPAC public meeting. So I'm sure you've all heard the news, you know, pleased to say that the new Director of National Intelligence was the first confirmation of the Biden administration, um, Ms. Avril Haynes, and during her confirmation, she stated security clearance reform will be a high priority for her, and she will come up to speed to understand the progress made thus far and the extent and nature of the problems with the existing process. So we're thrilled to have her um, in our lane and helping us move forward on trusted workforce and everything else um, we have our hands on. So to give you a little update on trusted workforce, um, in January, exactly January 15th, uh, OPM and ODNI as the executive agents signed a joint executive correspondence. This EC really shifted from the prior phase of Trusted Workforce where we work to reduce the DI inventory, and I'm sure you'll hear from DCSA um, where they are at their steady state of producing background investigations. But we shifted to phase two of Trusted Workforce 2.0. And the phase two really focuses on policy development for the implementation of, of the new government-wide approach, the policy levels, and how we're gonna get through the um, personal vetting process from beginning to end. So the EC, um, one of the main topics in this was guidance for the executive branch departments and agencies and explains the differences between our Trusted Workforce 1.25 and Trusted Workforce 1.5 transitional states. So we're doing this process in, you know, iteratively versus, you know, one big change at once. So working on the continuous vetting um, we're working to ensure agencies are capable and ready to enroll in one of these transitional states. The ultimate goal for transitioning now is that continuous vetting will satisfy the traditional PR process. So we're, we're not going to be doing the periodic reinvestigation every five, ten years. Um, all employees in the national security population and those contractors, our NIST um, contracts, will be enrolled in a CV capability where checks will be done ongoing. So we also included some milestones. Um, by September 30, 2021, all departments and agencies must enroll their full national security population in at least the Trusted Workforce 1.25 capability. And DCSA will talk about that, I'm sure, in their um, update, um, but it's a capability they are able to um, offer to their customer agencies. Um, and then by September 30, 2022, all departments and agencies must enroll their full national security population in the 1.5 capability. So there's just some differences in the capabilities regarding which record checks are being done. 
on, and certain things the agencies are also responsible for doing. So we are in um, helping our agencies enroll and ensuring to, um, you know, address any of their concerns during the implementation phase. And I also believe um, some of our NISPAC members have seen a copy of this correspondence, and that was part of the information sharing with um, some of the high-level policies that come out of our office to share with the NISPAC members. Um, additionally, um, in regard to personnel vetting, in December, the prior NCSC director, Mr. Evanina, released a statement regarding COVID-19 and how mental health um, impacts um, shouldn't, mental health should not impact national security eligibility, and really stating that counseling and undergoing treatment um, as a result of COVID or the associated stresses should not in itself be considered a negative or disqualifying factor for rendering eligibility or access to classified. And also in January, our new acting director for NCSC, Mr. Michael Orlando, signed another memo reiterating Mr. Emmanina's statement that there are the COVID impacts um, on the cleared workforce, and um, we're just concerned and want to ensure that the well-being and seeking counseling to address these concerns um, are being taken care of, and it is definitely a positive step and not a disqualifier. Um, let's see, one other area I do want to talk about, and um, we've gotten some questions, and I know it's been in the news. Um, OPM did issue their um, clarifying guidance on marijuana use and reiterating the federal drug-free workplace. Um, but just wanted to state and remind that there was a 2014 memo that came out from DNI stating that the adherence to the federal laws of using marijuana is illegal to controlled substance. So we're still following that guidance. It's still valid. However, we are considering putting together clarifying guidance and also monitoring legislation. Um, and I know you all, um, ISIS has asked us to give a background on the impacts of COVID. Um, ODNI continues to operate with limited staff. Even though we're not back to business as usual, we still have um, lots of staff working on team type of schedules. We are operational and we're ready and able to respond to questions and concerns from our partner agencies and industry. We just ask you to be patient. Our response times may be a little longer. However, um, important for you all is that the Scattered Castles program and our continuous evaluation systems, help desk personnel are still available and they are fully operational. And we continue to attend and brief at industry-related conferences and panels, um, and you know, virtually. We are available and can, and do want to continue our partnership with our stakeholders here. Um, regarding the NISPOM rule implementation, DNI and CIA are working together to implement the NISPOM rule and retract any references to the prior NISPOM manual. Um, I know they are working on making changes internally to um, new acquisitions. Um, and I'm not sure if CIA, um, CIA came on the line or if they're available if they want to provide any more details. Um, if not, otherwise, um, I am finished and thank you very much. Um, do, are there any questions? Okay, well, thank you, Valerie. That was very helpful. Thank you. Okay, up, sure. Up next is uh, Mr. Rob McRae, Director of the National Security Services Division, and Mr. Rich uh, Josserant, Deputy Director for Industrial Security at the Department of Homeland Security for their updates. Gentlemen. Hey, good morning. Uh, thank you for an opportunity sure. here to update everyone. So. Uh, the department uh, continues uh, its important mission of protecting the homeland through counterterrorism efforts, mitigating homeland security threats. 
securing cyberspace and critical infrastructure, securing the country's air, land, and sea borders, and strengthening the uh, preparedness posture. Our workforce largely uh, posture rem largely remains in a telework, remote work environment, with the exception of uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, uh, border operations, port operations. Obviously, they are uh, they continue to uh, uh, you know operate uh, in in various uh, areas throughout the country. Uh, one thing of note here is through the department's Operation Vaccinate Our Workforce, or Operation Vow, uh, and through a partnership with the Veterans Administration, uh, we have successfully vaccinated over 58,000 mission critical employees uh, here in the department. So uh, we are uh, continuing uh, with that important program here and, uh, and getting uh, the, the population of our uh, law enforcement personnel vaccinated here. And so with uh, an update uh, with regard to industrial security, I have uh, my deputy here, uh, Rich DeJosseran. Rich? Thanks, Rob. Good morning, everyone. Um, try to be pretty brief here. Um, as everybody knows, I'm sure that, uh, you know, DHS, um, we receive a more, majority of our industrial security services from DSA through a uh, special uh, service agreement. Uh, however, we continue to work with DCSA. My team is continually working with them on the implementation of the new NISPOM final rule. Um, specifically, uh, our person working with our personnel security team in regards to uh, C3, we are developing and implementing communication plans. We're developing policy documents, and we are also developing reporting tools, or in the process of developing reporting tools for C3. And uh, we continue working with DCSA for FOCI assessments uh, regarding accepting uh, NIDs. And uh, while we will still conduct our own risk assessments with those NIDs, uh, we will make a risk management decision, get with our CSO, who's the CSA, to determine if we are going to accept those NIDs based on our risk assessments. So again, we are still uh, you know, in the process of the developing and working hand in hand with DCSA. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Anybody have any questions for our colleagues at uh, DHS? Okay. Thank you. So the next update we'll hear from is from Mr. Mark uh, Hynoski, Director of Security Policy at the Department of Energy. Mark? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to give DOE's update uh, on uh, the NISP um, implementation and our COVID uh, return to work status. DOE has concluded uh, a review of the NISP CFR requirements against the department's current security requirements and has noted a number of areas that will be addressed either uh, via page changes to the security directives or through a secretarial policy memoranda. Um, the one that uh, stands out, obviously, is the NIDS language uh, from the recent NDAA um, update. Our DEER clause, that's the DOE Acquisition Regulation uh, Security Clause, references DOE security directives rather than the NISP. Um, to account for other security assets within the department. And because it does not uh, specifically address the NISP, uh, we'll, there is no need to update uh, that security clause, although there will be other updates to the DEER to address um, the NIDS and FCL processing. Our COVID return to work uh, status in March of this year DOE issued an updated COVID-19 workplace safety plan and held a department-wide safety pause, which included all federal and contractor uh, employees. The safety pause was led by senior leaders within the organization uh, via virtual town hall style uh, meetings. Uh, the pause uh, introduced the updated COVID workplace safety plan uh, reviewed and reinforced COVID safety protocols at the department, provided an open dialogue uh, between employees and management about the challenges associated with the COVID-19 protocols. Um, 
we have uh, also shared vaccine information, including uh, vaccine availability through the department and encourage the workforce to be vaccinated. Uh, our current operating status is that we continue maximum telework throughout the department uh, in compliance with the OMB goal to operate at 25% of normal building occupancy or lower uh, for sites experience high community prevalence of the trend or transmission of the virus. Uh, that 25% uh, occupancy standard uh, can be waived uh, upon approval by the secretary. Um, that, that's our update for uh, today and uh, I'll provide any answers to any questions uh, anyone may have. Thank you, Mark, we appreciate that. And next we're gonna hear from Mr. Chris Heilig to give the NRC uh, update. And then after that, we're gonna take a, uh, a five minute break. All right, Chris, you're up. Uh, good morning. Um, I, I'll, I'll end up kicking it over to Dennis Brady for the NISPOM implementation and COVID information. But in terms of personnel security, our updates, there aren't really much of an update to provide. Um, our volume of cases and adjudication timeliness is stable. Um, we were fortunate that our agency was able to continue processing cases as usual, um, even during the COVID restrictions. Um, our process is primarily electronic. Um, it, things are getting a little easier that, that we could not do in person, for instance, drug tests and fingerprinting. Um, as COVID restrictions are easing, we were able to take care of those steps at uh, almost a normal pace again. Um, and um, as things uh, progress in the COVID world and we will obviously get back to normal a little quicker because we were not as impacted as some of the other agencies. Um, that's essentially all I have in terms of personnel security updates. I would ask Dennis to, to take over from there. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, everybody, Dennis Brady. From uh, the NRC perspective, we continue to uh, regulate the uh, civilian use of commercial uh, nuclear energy uh, in uh, the academic and medical uses as well. The uh, NRC is continuing to implement the requirements of the NISPOM, although like all other agencies, we've had to come up with alternative means for uh, conducting that, but working with our industry uh, stakeholder partners, we've been able to achieve those goals. Uh, as an agency in our COVID response, uh, most of the agency is in uh, what we have as phase two for maximum telework, but some of our regional offices uh, still uh, are in our phase one for uh, mandatory telework, but are still able to conduct uh, our functions as the regulator for nuclear energy. Um, that's my uh, report for uh, the NRC. Great. Right, does anyone have any questions for our friends at the, uh, the NRC? All right, with that, we're gonna take a five minute break. I've got 11.04 here. So, uh, you know, by 11.09, 11.10, we'll uh, start back up. And our first speaker, when we come back, will be this Miss uh, Stacy uh, Bachanik. All right. Five minute break.
Welcome back. Let me turn things over again to Mr. Mark Bradley. All right. Thank you so much, Madam Moderator. All right, next, we're going to hear from Ms. Stacy uh, Boschanek, uh, Director of Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, also known as CNMC Policy. Stacy, all yours. Oh, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? I can. Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay, good. Um, so uh, as of Monday, I have, am now the Director of Supply Chain Risk Management for OUSDANS. And so today I'm going to give you some updates on the whole enchilada that we're working on. So with CMMC, we are continuing to work through the rulemaking process. We have um, started uh, the adjudication of the comments in earnest. Um, and uh, based on those comments, we've taken, uh, gone back and looked at the model and are considering some possible changes in response to those uh, uh, questions and comments, but we, we're not ready to publicize exactly what those are yet. We are moving forward with our pilot and getting the uh, C3PAOs uh, assessed at the CNMC level three. And as we uh, consider the information that they're pulling together with those assessments, as being sensitive information. So each and every C3PAO that will be performing the assessments will have to have a CMMC level three assessment done on themselves first. Every uh, assessment that they accumulate and, and uh, review will be uh, housed in the DISA uh, GovCloud. And that information will then be ported over to the uh, SPURS system where Contracting officers and program managers will have the opportunity to go in to validate that companies have the appropriate CMMC level for the contracts that they're competing on. We have uh, had a couple of pilots that have um, canceled and waived off for various and sundry reasons. Um, some of them had uh, award dates in June, and our C3PAOs didn't look like they were going to be ready in time, and one of the main tenets of our pilots is we're not going to impact the timing of any of the award cycles for our acquisitions at this time. We're also working very closely with international cooperation. They always confuse me because they call themselves the IC, and coming from BIA, I'm like, wait, who? <laughs> but international cooperation is working very closely with us to make sure that we get the agreements in place with our partners because they're uh, very interested in participating in CNMC. We have had some countries uh, indicate that they may want to wholesalely uh, adopt the CMMC uh, process, and then we have others that may want to be their own C3PAO or may set up their own accreditation body. We've also had other agencies within um, the federal government uh, um, express interest in CMMC, DHS is looking to onboard, they're uh, planning some pilot activity and pathfinder activity here in the new future, and as well as GSA is going to run some pilots for us as well. So CMMC is rocking and rolling. There is um, a 30-day assessment being done by internally uh, by the new administration just to look to make sure that implementation is going the way that they expect it to. And um, there's also a GAO assessment going on for Congress. So um, based on those two, I'm sure we, we may have some tweaks to the program, but wholesalely we've seen a lot of support through the administration for CMMC. On the supply chain, uh, supply chain risk management side, we're working um, with uh, trusted capital in setting up uh, avenues for companies to come in and hopefully get some investment to try to mitigate the interest uh, from our adversaries in, in investing in some of our um, innovative companies. And we're also working very closely with uh, many of the supply chain illumination tools. We use some of them during project warp speed to uh, further our capabilities, and that seemed to be very successful. So we're looking at that across the board. And we also have set up a supply chain working group with uh, members of uh, OUSD, across OUSD and the services to come up with a lexicon and taxonomy and a standardization to look at supply chain risk and how to assess it and mitigate it and then what are the tolerance levels that we can expect. And that's pretty much my update. Uh, barring any questions, I appreciate your time and the ability to, to speak with you. 
Great. Anyone have any questions for uh, Stacy? All right, Stacy, go, go back to the beach. Uh, I'm on my way. Thank you guys so much. It. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Enjoy yourself. Yeah. Thank right. you. Well, we, sure. We, we have uh, Roy Jacino and Chris Pollack with the General Services Administration here to brief us next on the GSA's Black Label Safe Removal Program. Gentlemen. Hey, good morning, Mr. Chairman. This is Chris Pollack with GSA, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the, the NISPAC today. Um, as, as you mentioned, we also have Roy Jacino from the DOD Lock Program here to uh, address some of the issues. Um, by way of introduction, I'm, I'm the uh, branch chief of the standardization and engineering branch of GSA. I'm also the program manager for the GSA approved security equipment. Um, I'd like to talk today about uh, a recent um, policy uh, related issue uh, that addresses the removal of some older GSA approved containers and vault doors that are currently used for protection of classified information. Um, next slide, please. There we go. Uh, yeah, so this one looks like, at least on my screen, it's a little bit hard to see. But if you have a copy of the, the presentation, um, maybe you'll be able to look at it closer there. Um, I'll run through it real quickly. Um, back at the end of January of this year, we issued this letter to the GSA-approved security training schools and equipment uh, manufacturers, laying out the requirement for the removal of black label containers and vault doors. Um, I understand ITSU is also working on, uh, current, on, on a similar policy uh, that should be issued shortly. Um, if you could read the table, <laughs> you would see that uh, the black label uh, containers are all at least 30 years old, um, some of them as old as 70 years old. Um, the, the at the end of service, the, uh, the removal date um, that's listed in this letter is uh, between 2024 and 2028. Um, this gives everyone at least three years, um, and in most uh, cases, uh, seven years, to uh, to identify the older equipment and get it replaced. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, that's just the signature page, so uh, again, next slide. Um, so here are some examples of the uh, of containers that have the different labels. The containers that will need to be replaced are, um, the sample is on the right side where you can see there's a black label, a black lettering on a silver label. Um, if you have the containers with that label, they will need to be replaced, again, in sometime in the next three to seven years. Um, containers that have the red label, um, red lettering on silver background is on the right, uh, or is on the left-hand uh, sample, um, do not need to be replaced. Okay, uh, next uh, slide, please. So why is this equipment being uh, removed from service for protecting the classified information? Again, as I mentioned a couple times, the containers are uh, getting very old. Um, this leads to uh, problems with, um, uh, that can be attributed both to safety issues, security issues, and repair issues. Under safety issues, um, a lot of the moving parts on containers that are over 30 years old tend to wear out. Uh, you get worn slides, you get uh, outstops that break off, and you also can get uh, rusty interiors, which can affect the operation and, and security of the containers. Um, over the years, there have been a lot of different improvements to the containers, so, which were not incorporated in some of these older containers, uh, things like changes in the lock box, and also changes in the locks uh, from mechanical to electrical mechanical uh, locks. Uh, there's also repair issues. Many of the manufacturers who originally produced the equipment are no longer business, so repair parts are no longer available. Um, so all these factors add up to a situation where it's time to start removing the, uh, the older equipment from service. Um, I will now throw it over to Roy Jacino to go over some of the, uh, the industry requirements. Roy? Oh, thank you, Chris. Uh, my name is Roy Jacino. I am the chair of the uh, IACT and SEAL subcommittee that um, oversees these specifications for all the different GSA security equipment. I'm also the director of the DOD LOCK program uh, for the Department of Defense. So, so basically, we put out this um, um, letter to all the, to all the um, GSA manufacturers and the training. 
we'll, we will be working with all the agencies to get the letter out to um, all of uh, all the agencies so they can plan. And what we're asking right now is uh, everybody to start surveying your facilities for GSA approved containers. You know, determine number of black label containers that you have and vault doors that are in use, and that'll be on the list for replacement. Um, determine your requirements, facility accreditation reviews, uh, possible classified holding reductions. Uh, work with the uh, accrediting authorities and contracting officers to formulate a company plan for replacement. And again, this is going, this is government wide uh, through all federal government. So this is. Um, you know, again, we put out these time frames. We feel that will be plenty of time for everybody to start um, um, addressing this and looking at it and surveying and making plans. Um, and again, uh, we put we put the date out there, um, and of course it will be flexible. Um, but we have to start somewhere to replace these older uh, containers. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And that's really all we have. Um, please uh, submit any questions that you have, and we'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for our friends from uh, TSA? All right. We're now moving into the portion of the meeting where we get reports from the NISPAC working groups. However, we're not going to be discussing all of them, but we have provided slides with, with highlights of all of them. We'll only be discussing uh, today the clearance, cost, and NISP information systems authorization, also known as NISA, working groups at this time. All right, Greg, you want to take back over? Greg? It looks like his line may have been disconnected. <laughs> All right. Do you think you can raise him, or do you want me to? Go ahead. Uh, this is David Scott. I'm, I'm available um, uh, to present. Right. If, if you guys ready? Mark, do you want me what? to speak for Greg's team? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. I'll 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 take over for for Greg here, and and then we'll 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 get right to it. All right. Um, let's see. All right. You've heard from some uh, of the sisters on of the this is hell. I mean the. SCAs on the uh, high level points of what we was discussed during the clearance working group and on March 3rd, 2021. Um, since the last NISPAC, we also discussed the Small Business Administration, the SBA regulation combining their mentor protege programs issued this past fall. The SBA rule appears to eliminate the requirement for a joint venture to have an entity eligibility determination or EED if the entities making up the joint venture already have EEDs themselves. However, this interpretation of the regulation's language is not actually what the regulation intends, and it would contradict NISP requirements. Therefore, we will be issuing an ISO notice soon in hey, coordination Mark, I'm back with... Going. I'm sorry. Uh, I did, Greg, let me just finish this paragraph, and it's yours. Sure. With SBA, the Small Business Administration, to clarify the joint venture EED requirements. Hi, right, Greg, you can pick it up, but we have continued in terms okay. of stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, I apologize, everyone. In, in my case, it was a, uh, simply a matter of my chin hitting the phone, and I accidentally disconnected. So, anyway, these things happen, right? All right. So, um, so you already covered some of the points. So, yeah, the working group uh, did meet, and uh, we a lot of things that were discussed today we discussed uh, during the working group obviously the trusted workforce uh, ongoing um, transition uh, to 2.0 was discussed the uh, the j pass to DISS transition uh, the NISP, NISPOM changing over to a rule and the implications of the, some of the changes particularly C3 um, but also a little bit on uh, TS accountability, limited facility security clearances, um, and the intrusion detection uh, recognition uh, that not just UL 2050, but other entities that uh, meet nationally testing uh, uh, laboratory, nationally recognized testing laboratory standards, uh, 
which Intertech, I believe, is one such other entity that does uh, qualify as certified under those uh, NERDL and RTL standards. Um, and there was a little bit of discussion about security vulnerability assessments, uh, the, the ratings, uh, how that's evolving, ratings uh, for SVAs. Uh, so, uh, and of course, discussion about um, oversight in general in, in the uh, post-COVID environment. Um, now, did you cover the other issues that I was going to mention? I think you did cover joint ventures and small business administrations. Is that right? Uh, uh, yes, yes, okay. yes. And then the, the cost, did you discuss the Miss Benedy cost? No, we, we were just, just, just getting there when you oh, popped okay. back on, so, so please. So, okay, and so this is a continuation of, uh, well, let me just say, this is a broader um, sub-element to an initiative that ISU under, has undertaken uh, beginning about two or so years ago um, to refine and simplify um, to support agencies uh, in their efforts to provide overall data with respect to their classified national security information programs as required by executive order and directive uh, to, to ISU on an annual basis. Um, the one probably that would always get the most attention was reporting on the estimated numbers of derivative and original classification activities, um, which in and of itself was a highly suspect number. It was an estimate, but even with that, it was an extrapolation. Um, and in any event, we, ISU, uh, the director, suspended the collection of data um, while we worked on refining our collection efforts, consolidating them, and, and taking advantage of technology um, in, in, our, in doing these things. And so cost is, is one of those elements within the overall collection of data um, that is required. And in, in this case in particular, we're talking about cost incurred by contractors under uh, CSA cognizance, under cognizance security agency cognizance. And so that's what we've been focused on uh, in this area. And we, the government, have met several times discussing this. Um, and what we're, we're trying to do before we bring industry in to see what we've uh, come up with is for each CSA to bring uh, their proposal for how they intend to gather costs that their contractors under the NISP, under their cognizance, incur. Uh, that said, it, it, could be, it could be that each CSA comes up with something that they all agree on, and, and we just have one mechanism. Um, one of the keys, of course, is we do not want to have duplication of cost collection, and keeping with the overall intent of the reform effort for data collection, we want to keep it as simple as possible. Um, so once we get to that point where we have the CSAs uh, way ahead um, and some degree of consensus, we would then bring NISP industry, uh, NISPAC industry, excuse me, uh, in to take a look at where, what we have and to get, to get their input. So that's what we have on, on that. Um, but turning to the, um, the let's see, the um, NISA working group, the Information Systems Authorization Working Group, uh, we also met, and as has also been stated uh, during the updates that were given, uh, one of the topics was uh, sanitizing solid state devices, drives, also known as SSDs, and and appreciate the update that DOD gave. Uh, the one thing I would add to that is we, ISU, do intend to reach out, actually we started already, to the Committee on National Security Systems, CNSS, um, as they set the policy, national policy, for um, utilizing information, national security information systems that process classified. So in this case, as it relates to remediation methods for drives involved in classified spillages, we want to at least ask them to examine the existing policy to see if there's uh, any any need uh, to make some adjustments. Um, so with that, um, what I want to do before we collectively take questions in this part of the agenda is 
we want to hear from first David Scott from DCSA to give uh, an update on DCSA's information systems. David? Yes, thank you, sir. I uh, appreciate that. Um, so uh, I, I started off this position as the Miss AO last week, so um, uh, I appreciate the invite and I look forward to working uh, with the NISPAC uh, members and uh, the audience as a whole. Um, previous to this, I was no um, stranger to the, to the NISP. Uh, the last four years, I served as a regional authorization official in the Capital Region and served as acting uh, Southern Region AO for the past year, as well as uh, very extensive uh, work in cleared industry myself. A um, couple uh, quick updates um, with the leadership changes um, uh, in Capital Region. Uh, there is an acting. Uh, Jamie Davis, she's acting while we look to fill backfill my position in Capital Region. And in Southern Region, there is a, um, we've selected and have on board a permanent Southern Region AO. His name is William Barn. Um, he just started a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to, to his uh, contributions to the team. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So, um, from a metric standpoint, these are pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to run through all of them. What I want to do is just kind of uh, highlight a couple of points. Um, the, the system registrations and EMAS or the systems that are authorized are staying at a steady steady state. Little, little increase, but uh, not, not too significant. Um, but what I want to uh, inform everyone is we've implemented over the past, um, since about January, past few months, a triage process. What we identified with it within our agency as we moved to RMF um, we, and, and we had some backlog in certain areas, we were uh, getting to the point where we had some ISSPs, um, their queues were getting big, and uh, we had industry uh, waiting uh, for a, uh, some sort of communication on whether or not what they submitted was actually uh, in the process of being authorized. And we were having some timelines where they wouldn't receive uh, comment back up to like 80 days. Uh, that, and, and then the, the, then the unfortunate uh, case where industry would submit something uh, in this, uh, you know, somewhat new process. We, we've been in a few years now where simple mistakes were made that we just could not move forward. So what we did was we implemented over the past few months a triage process where within the first 10 to 14 days, we'll take a look at what's submitted by industry. We'll make sure that it's meeting the mark, for, and then we'll put it into our queue. If we find some simple mistakes uh, throughout um, the, the uh, initial triage, we'll return that so that industry can immediately address those concerns so industry's not waiting, um, you know, uh, 60, 90 days before they hear something from us. So we've already seen some, uh, some very good uh, return on investment with that process, and we'll continue to do that. Um, the other uh, piece that I wanted to, to hit is um, – the, the AOs as a part of COVID, uh, initially when we first started the pandemic, we were deferring the on-sites and doing roughly around six months authorizations. This is going back a year ago. And then once we realized that the uh, pandemic was going to be um, a little, a lot longer term than what everyone expected, uh, the AOs got together last fall and we said, we, we need to get, we need to do better. So we came up with a framework to where if the industry package um, is sufficient, it's solid, the controls are addressed, the, the risk is clear and understood and acceptable. We would issue a three-year authorization deferring the on-site until we can get to a post-pandemic or regular business model. We're just now starting to see some benefits of that. Uh, we still have the tool of a conditional authorization if, in fact, uh, we're still missing a few pieces uh, that we could do a six-month authorization. However, we are moving more towards a model of a three-year authorization deferring the on-site, um, and, and that is actually starting to, to reap benefits. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, this is a slide that we just started recently putting together. It's our top 10 miscompliant controls, uh, non-compliant controls within EMAS. We, um, this is new. Uh, we're still digesting this information as an agency, but we're hopefully, hopefully you're going to use this tool internally and externally to help address some consistency concerns. I won't go into too much detail, but you'll see the top one right there, RA5, vulnerability scanning. And I can tell you from this, coming from this field over the past few years, there, um, there is a misinterpretation of that control. For example, uh, vulnerability scanning, we have a lot of industry uh, uh, team members, our ISSMs would um, uh, state that they're using a certain tool uh, like a SCAP compliance checker. Um, that is not the intent of that control. It is a scanning tool, but the control itself is vulnerability scanning. 
what is the process for um, finding weaknesses in the application of the system? For example, your Microsoft patches. So it is just a misunderstanding of the actual control. So what we're going to do is take this, um, this metric and start identifying some trends and then start um, education internally and externally uh, for consistency uh, across the country. Next slide, please. So DAPM, uh, we, we are in the early process of a planning for a DAPM upgrade. Uh, what I want to call to your attention is we are well aware of the uh, NIST uh, Rev5 uh, 853 controls. We are well aware we'll have to do an update for that. Um, we are also have been working since last August internally uh, on a NIST connection process guide. It is the first of our kind for an agency. Um, over the past many years, um, other agencies, um, DISA, et cetera, they actually have a connection process guide on how to do business with them for interconnected networks. And what we, we, we saw, there was great benefits with those type of uh, documents. So we actually are starting to draft our own and expand upon uh, the, the requirements, processes, and guidance on how to um, have an interconnection with, our, with, uh, with the NISP. So, it's a, it's a, so some of the highlights are a process flow map. If you're going inter, to interconnect with a government uh, a government uh, network, here's what you would do, and it would follow, it would follow process flows. We'll provide templates and, and easy to read guidance, so it'll be available. Um, it, it should be easy to read for any government or industry stakeholders. So we're looking forward to that. We're in the early stages um, of developing. We understand we've got some coordination aspects to do. We'll definitely share it with uh, the NISPAC as well. Uh, but those, we're very excited about that document. We look forward to, to sharing that with you guys. And next slide. So uh, NIST common uh, EMAS issues, um, no changes here. One thing I do want to kind of call out to is uh, if we could, uh, you know, uh, make, make for everybody's awareness, especially industry ISSMs, is uh, ensuring that we're checking the security classification guidance um, uh, before we, we in, uh, input stuff into to EMAS, just making sure that we're double-checking any classification guidance at all. We have a process if we have an SEG that states certain controls are, um, are at a classification level. We have a process for handling that in our job aids. Um, but just want to make sure that that, that that word is spread and that we're, that we're adhering to that. Um, but other than that, EMAS common issues are pretty much uh, straightforward. We're getting the questions into our group mailbox and we're addressing them on, a, on the regular. And um, next slide is uh, just questions and some available resources, and that's all I have unless there's questions from, from the group. Thank you. Does anyone have any, before we turn back to vetting statistics for that process, anyone have any questions on information systems authorization? Hi, this is Rosie Barrero, uh, Industry NISPAC. I just wanted to ask a quick question, um, and thank you, uh, Dave, for that. Just wanted to ask for the top non-compliant controls, would, um, would you be willing to post examples of compliance in uh, the frequently asked questions online for industry? That is the goal. We, we, I've, I've got to work through uh, the, the coordination and publication process, but that is the main goal of this, uh, this, this tool. We've been wanting to put, now that we have enough data and EMAS collected over the last year, year and a half, we're able to, to provide some trends. Um, but the goal is absolutely to, to share some of this information with industry, um, for, for common understanding and consistency across the board. But, yeah, that, that is the goal. Um, no, no promises on timelines. I'm, I'm still a little new to this position and understanding the coordination aspect of it, but we'll definitely do as much as we can to get that out to you guys. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Unless there's no other questions for that, and we'll, we'll now look at some vetting statistics and I'll ask uh, Mariana Martineau, please, to uh, start that, looking at the uh, background investigations, adjudications, uh, and vetting uh, data, please. Mariana. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be covering background investigations, continuous vetting, and adjudication mission updates for DCSA today. Regarding background investigations, our total inventory is currently just slightly over 205,000 cases, of which 34,000 are industry investigations, which is uh, consistent with inventory from about a year ago and less than half of the inventory from two years ago. 
timeliness statistics for end-to-end -end processing for industry cases, including initiation, investigation, and adjudication in FY21 second quarter improved significantly as compared to one to two years ago. Uh, specifically, our Tier 5s were running end-to-end -end about 159 days and Tier 3s 127 days. Um, timeliness and inventory do continue to fluctuate due to seasonal onboarding and hiring. However, of course, in the past year, as we've all talked about here, we've had a few unpredictable uh, impacts related to COVID-19 and uh, specifically surges and occasional IT hiccups, but we are seeing a gradual increase in timeliness as a result of some of these challenges that we've experienced over the past year. For the background investigation group, as COVID continues, we are maximizing telework as most staff are already working remotely, and we are continuing to use the executive agent approved alternative processes, including telephone interviews. While roughly about 5% of the background investigations in, in our inventory have been delayed or placed on hold due to COVID challenges, our team is constantly revisiting each case to continue to work and close these cases as quickly as possible. DCSA remains postured to and committed to mitigating COVID-related impacts, both timeliness uh, and our overall inventory without degrading quality. Um, I'll talk a little bit further and in a bit on the adjudications timeline. So let's go ahead and switch over to the next slide and talk about the Vetting Risk Operations Center. The VROC is staying laser focused on all industry functions. And as you know, that includes investigations, submissions, interims, uh, periodic reinvestigations and continuous vetting deferments, processing incident reports and other dis uh, or the defense information system for security customer service requests and balancing timeliness to support mission readiness and identifying and mitigating insider threat concerns. To date in FY21, the VROC has submitted uh, roughly 62,000 background investigation requests. 90% of those have had an interim determination made on average within five to seven business days. Effective April the 1st, as I'm sure everybody here knows, investigation requests can no longer be submitted in JPAS, and industry must use the Defense Information System for security for all security management functions to include investigation submissions. So as a reminder, please submit your fingerprints for initial clearances prior to submitting an investigation request. The VROC cannot open a background investigation or enter or issue an interim uh, determination without first the required fingerprint results when applicable. Regarding continuous vetting, DCSA is responsible for implementing the DOD continuous vetting program and has begun offering the Trusted Workforce 1.25 service to non-federal agencies. Our goal is to have the entire DOD cleared population enrolled in the Trusted Workforce Continuous Vetting Compliant Program by the, end of, by the end of 2021. So you'll see a significant increase in enrollment to FY as we are working to achieve this goal. A few items to note here is enrollments do include the NISP contractor population. Currently about 675,000 industry subjects are enrolled in continuous vetting. And all industry periodic reinvestigations deferred subjects, or about 121,000, are also enrolled in Trusted Workforce 1.5 automated records checks. Um, and an, an additional 350,000 industry subjects are pending enrollment. The VROC is currently enrolling all subjects post adjudication and is also working to extract SF 86s on file within the Defense Information System for Security and other program. I'm sorry excuse me, other systems of record. What we need from industry is to be responsive for any overdue periodic reinvestigations or if an out-of-cycle SF-86 is requested for submission. Continuous vetting enrollment does require at a minimum the 2010 version of the SF-86, of which we have most of them, but not all since the 2010 version wasn't deployed until the 2012 timeframe. If needed, the VROC will be sending specific instructions to individual companies and DISC this spring, so please be on the lookout. For continuous vetting alert management, post-enrollment alerts are generated based on established thresholds which align to the federal investigative standards and adjudicative guidelines. 
We're currently seeing an average of a 6% alert rate, although we are baselining a large volume of population. Criminal and financial indicators are still the most common valid actionable alerts. And so far in FY21, we received 19,000 industry alerts on 14,000 unique industry subjects, of which 8,000, wow, this is a lot of numbers, or 48% were not previously known. So what does that mean? It means that these alerts represent information that should have been self-reported. And our goal moving forward is to encourage self-reporting of information as early as it is, as it is known as it will avoid future continuous vetting alerts. Moving on to the next slide about the CAF. So today the CAF continues to apply portfolio management techniques to deliver national security, suitability, and credentialing adjudications. Our readiness portfolio represents those adjudicative actions designed to get people to work, where the risk management portfolio manage, risk, manages risk within the trusted workforce. So far in FY21 through the second quarter, the CAF adjudicated tiered background investigation products in an average of 16 days for initials or 92 days for periodic investigations. For the industry population, we did the same work and adjudicated initials in an average of 17 days or 119 days for periodic reinvestigations. We do expect the adjudicative timeliness performance for PRs will continue to be higher than historical averages due in large part to the changing derogatory nature of the periodic reinvestigations we're receiving for adjudication, coupled with delays related to COVID-19 and obtaining additional information from subjects. Our current total industry inventory is about 30,000 cases, 59% of which are within our readiness portfolio and the remaining 41% in risk management. The CAF is continuing to focus on processes and on improving processes, timeliness, implementing Lean Six Sigma improvements, and increasing efficiencies as we continue to work with our colleagues in the background investigation and the vetting risk operation groups to implement the trusted workforce strategy. We will also continue to focus on preparing our workforce for these challenges while also striving to continuously improve our services and support to your mission operations and needs. Some of our focus areas for the remainder of this fiscal year uh, include reciprocity. As an update, because I know this is a sensitive subject for those on this call, last year the CAF and the VROC executed a joint Lean Six Sigma project focusing on improving the end-to-end -end reciprocity process. Last month, the uh, DCSA deployed a change in the defense information security that allows industry reciprocity customer service requests to go directly to the CAF. This updated process is functioning without any technical issues and is already improving the end-to-end -end timeliness. Over the next month, the CAF anticipates further process improvements as we implement the remaining Lean Six Sigma efficiencies, and we will be bringing DCSA to full compliance with the DNI five-day end-to-end processing requirement. We are also looking to deploy an adjudicative assistance tool, which is designed to implement uh, machine learning focused on enhancing adjudicative quality assessments and training programs. And as you heard Valerie talk about earlier today, we are continuing to focus on mental health care and destigmatizing seeking mental health care treatment for cleared personnel with losing a security clearance. We started that process in FY20 and will continue to do so through FY21. We are expanding our messaging through the DCSA web portals and social media outlets, frequently asked questions, and other information located in the DCSA CAF resources webpage. Our mental health campaign efforts also include external outreach engagements with clinicians, psychologists, security managers, and defense organizations. And again, we're trying to get our message out that simply seeking mental health care treatment is not in and of itself a reason why people lose security clearances. I would like to call to your attention some amended uh, COVID-19 extension processing at the CAF. Last year, when um, at the beginning of COVID-19, we had we evaluated our processes and implemented um, a, basically a, a hold, if you would, where we were not receiving responses to our requests for additional information or other uh, actions related to COVID-19. 
We recently reevaluated our current operating procedures and are reinstating our pre-COVID business processes and procedures regarding correspondence requirements for responses. We will no longer be issuing indefinite automatic extensions related to the COVID-19 pandemic and subjects through their security managers and facility security officers will have 30 days from the date of our request for an action in the Defense Information System for Security to comply with that re official request for information. If you have any questions, you know, please send those to us through the DISC portal. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have, although you can find some additional information on the DCSA website regarding this announcement. Lastly, I'd just like to call your attention to the bottom of the slide where I'm proud to share with you the uh, DOD CAS first annual report covering FY20. It highlights many of our accomplishments and continuous efforts to improve the DOD assigned adjudications and related personal security eligibility determinations, our adoption of streamlined business processes for security clearance processing timelines, and a return to healthy and stable inventories. We are committed to working with you, our customers, and continuing to build strong partnerships to increase information sharing and to support your operations and mission readiness. So if you can, take a moment to share and read our annual report and the link at the bottom of the slide. And pending your questions, that's all I have for this morning. Well, thank you, Mariana, for that uh, excellent comprehensive overview. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Okay. Um, Next, we're going to hear from Tracy Kendall uh, to provide some DOE uh, update metric data. Tracy? Uh, good afternoon, Greg and everyone. Uh, I'm Tracy Kendall, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to provide the DOE uh, personnel security update. Um, I know Mark had spoke earlier, uh, but just for those who didn't know that um, we do have a new secretary, and her name is uh, Secretary Jennifer Graham Holm. Um, the next thing I'll talk about is the DOE uh, personnel security statistics. And currently, we're meeting the ERPA timeliness goals for all investigative tiers based on the February uh, 2021 statistics. For our initial, our T5 initial, we met our ERPA goals um, 11 out of the last 12 months, and we expect that trend to continue. For the T3 initials, um, we've met our goals over the last six months and we expect that trend also continue. For T5Rs, um, we've met those goals over the last nine months and again, we expect that to continue. For T3, uh, we had one hiccup in June of 2020 with our initiation, with our initiation process, but since that time, we've been meeting the ERPA goals and again, we expect that trend to continue. Um, that's really all I have right now, uh, Greg, for the personnel security statistics. Uh, pending anyone's questions, this will conclude my briefing. Pretty short. Okay. Thank you, Tracy. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Next, we have NRC. Now, I believe Dennis Brady already gave some data on uh, the personnel security metrics, but we have Chris. Hi, League, if you have anything additional to add. Uh, well, I, I spoke earlier. I don't have anything additional to add. I, I, would, I would clarify we are meeting our ERPTA guidelines for uh, adjudications. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we didn't experience any slowdowns during COVID. So we would assume everything goes back to normal sooner than later as the COVID restrictions are lifted. And that's really all I have. Thank you, Chris. Um, so unless there's questions for Chris or any questions overall, with respect to the working groups from what you've heard this morning, um, I'll turn it back over to the chair. All right. Thanks, Greg. All right. Now we're going to hear from Mr. Perry Russell Hunter from the Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals, known as DOHA. Perry? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, NISPAC members. Uh, uh, DOHA is continuing to make uh, maximum use of telework except for the personnel who are conducting and supporting the in-person administrative hearings, the, the, the DOHA administrative judges, department counsel, and uh, support personnel. Um, obviously, the hearings are a core part of the DOHA mission.
missions. So by uh, tele having everybody else telework, we're maximizing the safety to everyone who's involved in those in-person hearings. Um, but leveraging telework has not affected Doha's productivity, um, and that's in, in large part thanks to the great partnership between Doha and the uh, Consolidated Adjudications Facility, uh, the leadership of Mariana Martineau, who you just heard from, and the, uh, the excellence and expertise of, of her staff and the uh, adjudicators of the CAF. Um, Calendar year 2020 was actually the highest average year for total numbers of statements of reasons reviewed and issued since, two, uh, since 2016. Um, and statements of reasons are still going out in, in typical numbers and are timely. Uh, we currently have uh, 330 uh, SOR reviews pending, which is a, a typical number. Um, at the end of January, we had 390 pending. Uh, uh, considering that uh, Doha reviewed and the CAF issued over 3,100 draft statements of reasons uh, during the period between March of 2020 and uh, March of 2021, uh, we're in great shape and we're current. Um, the uh, first four months of fiscal year 2021, um, we reviewed and the CAF issued uh, uh, 1,200 statements of reasons. So um, there's going to be a shift later this year uh, where Doha will begin pro uh, providing the SORs directly to industry uh, employees and also tracking them. Um, so that's something that uh, we've, we've mentioned before, but that, that's going to be happening uh, over the course of the, the next year. Um, and while the uh, uh, pandemic was uh, impacting the hearing process uh, because Doha was having challenges with uh, conventional video teleconferencing uh, due to the simple fact that there would often be uh, no operators available at the other end of the line where, where Doha needed to reach. Uh, uh, Doha has now tested and is making uh, good and effective use of something called the Defense Communication System, or DCS, uh, to conduct remote online virtual hearings for clearance holders and clearance applicants in locations where travel would still be unsafe or uh, where uh, we could not uh, uh, reach uh, the individual using conventional uh, video teleconference technology. Um, and uh, that is all I have um, uh, pending any questions uh, from the group. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Perry? Thank you, Perry. All right. Up next is Mr. Evan Korn from my uh, staff of ISOO, who will provide an update on the controlled unclassified information program known as CUI. Evan? Thanks, Mark. Uh, as Mark said, I'm Evan Korn. I'm the team lead for CUI at ISOO, and I support uh, the director of ISOO, who is the CUI executive agent. Uh, first, I wanted to start with um, a update on, for the CUI annual report that the president with some data we want to share with you. It's an initial analysis. Um, so we have 90% of agencies that are reporting that they will have their CUI policy done by the end of 2021. Uh, and this includes 65% uh, of agencies who report that they um, had their policy done or would have it done by December 20th, uh, December of 2020. In addition, 80% of agencies have already begun disseminating awareness products or training their workforce. Um, on the upcoming CUI implementation. Uh, in addition, 90% of agencies are reporting that they will meet the fiscal and cybersecurity safeguarding requirements by the December 31st, 2021 deadline. Uh, in addition, and uh, other good news, uh, the National Information Exchange Model, or NEAM, has released NEAM 5.0, which for the first time includes a CUI uh, metadata standard. Uh, for those not familiar, NEAM is uh, one of the common metadata standards. So this will uh, significantly improve uh, the metadata consistency that occurs uh, as metadata is used to um, in association with CUI. Okay, uh, and CUI Registry Committee and ISOO will serve as a mechanism to update and review changes to the CUI domain within me. And another good news, uh, NIST SB 800-172 has been published. Uh, this was formerly known as uh, the uh, draft NIST SP800-171B. 
so 172 uh, uh, establishes uh, recognized security protections for non-federal information systems that uh, process, store, or transmit CUI. It was released in final form February 2nd of this year. Um, it mainly involves changes to the narrative and boundaries and does not change the controls that are in place. Um, the controls within uh, the 172 are uh, often used in the CMC, uh, or C, sorry, CMMC level four and level five uh, uh, determine if contractors have the necessary controls in place. Um, okay, uh, I think a lot of people have been following uh, the issuance of the CUI bar um, uh, case. And right now, uh, it was projected to have go out for public comment from March to May of this year, but since we're already in mid April, uh, we um, are currently expecting this to get pushed back for comment later. Once it is out for comment, uh, we will hold an ad hoc stakeholders meeting uh, that will schedule uh, at the beginning of the public comment period to address um, concerns and um, discuss the um, draft version that will be up for comment. Uh, also want to encourage everyone to uh, take a CUI marketing trainings that we are offering uh, as ISU. Um, my colleague, uh, Charlene Wallace, who is a CUI training lead, uh, does a superb training about every month or two, um, and we announce that on our blog. And I'd recommend following the blog for um, uh, updates on when those are going to be. ISU issues a training certificate, um, and uh, to date, um, she's getting about five to 600 government industry personnel attending each training, and she's been doing that for now over a year. Uh, in addition, on training resources, the ISU uh, CUI website on its training page has a lot of training videos that can be uploaded easily in MP4 format right into learning management tools and we highly encourage both uh, agencies and industry to take advantage of that resource. Uh, that concludes uh, the CUI portion of the update. Thank you, Evan. Does anyone have any questions for uh, Evan on CUI? All right. We're now at the point of the meeting where we ask for NISPAC members to present any new business they may have. Anyone have any new business to discuss? All right, hearing none, um, do any other committee members have any questions or remarks before we uh, close out this meeting today? All right, hearing none. Our next NISPAC is scheduled for October 27th, 2021. We're hoping to have the next NISPAC in person, but we all also plan uh, to have it 100% virtual if uh, if needed. As a reminder, all NISPAC meeting announcements are posted in the Federal Registry Register approximately 30 days before uh, the meeting, along with being posted uh, to the ISU blog. All right, uh, with that, I'm going to uh, wish you all uh, a good day. Please stay healthy, and this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you so much. Bye. That concludes our conference. Once again, if you have any questions, please forward them to the NISPAC uh, email address. And thank you so much for using event services. You may now disconnect.